the Bible, a book whose origins lie thousands of years ago in the Middle East. It still inspires billions today. Creation roots us in the wonder of our own drama. What a beginning. Its teachings provoke controversy. The Ten Commandments are the hysterical believings of a group of desert tribes. We know the Bible is completely accurate. It shows me how dangerous revelation can be. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Seven figures from different walks of life offer their personal perspective on the best-selling book of all time and what it means to them. The women of the Bible still speak to us today. Who was this Jesus Christ and who was it that murdered him? Even if you've never read a word of the Bible, your life will have been shaped by it. In this programme, Howard Jacobson explores the story of the creation. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. With these exquisite opening sentences of the Old Testament, life begins. In six days, God speaks the universe into existence. There is no struggle and no harshness, a mere breath, and in God's own image, we are made. And then, seeing that his creation is good, he rests. Serene itself, the creation story excites angry controversy. On the one hand, churches for whom the creation story is literal truth. The universe exists to display the glory of God, and therefore those who try to give an account for the universe that exists in a non-God way are not only laughable, but they are blasphemous. On the other hand, fervent atheists are exasperated that anyone should still revere the stories of the Bible. Today, a fierce battle rages between those who believe that Genesis is a true account of how life began and those who think it's childish nonsense. It is impossible not to have a position. The creation story is either true or it's false. It either happened or it didn't. But are these our only choices? In this film, I aim to find a path between the fundamentalisms of religion and atheism, to find a vocabulary for describing the wonderful poetry of the creation story, which doesn't leave it vulnerable to the absolutes of faith or denial, and to explore why, whatever we believe, it's a story we cannot shake our imaginations free of. In the beginning, there is nowhere else to start. The book of Genesis teems with stories. Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Noah and Abraham. But the creation is the heart of it. It tells Jews and Christians alike how their world began, how God called forth life in abundance, causing it to grow and multiply. Finally creating man himself. To this day, it provides us with the rhythm of our working week, crowned by the Sabbath, the day of rest and worship. 
But the creation story also provides us with something still more fundamental, the first unequivocal statement in world literature of belief in a single, all-powerful God. This concept would be the Jews' great contribution to civilization, the unassailable foundation, not only of Judaism, but of Christianity and Islam. No other idea would have such a profound influence on the history of humanity. But where did the story of one God gifting the world into existence originate? Who were its authors? How was it meant to be read? And how, thousands of years after it was written, are we to read it now? Lord Sachs is Britain's chief rabbi, a theologian, a philosopher, and a biblical scholar. To understand Genesis 1, you have to understand that this is a polemic against all the stories in the ancient world about how the world came to be the way it is, which are all stories about multiplicities of God's huge cast list of deities, all of whom are fighting, squabbling, plotting each other's downfall or hacking each other to pieces. And they come in endless shapes and forms. And, of course, Judaism gets rid of the entire cast list all of a sudden you get this extraordinary radical idea that there is just one God. And he has no company up there. The only company he has is this creature that he has created in love in his own image, which is why Genesis 1 is so serene. God says, let there be and there is. We forget how radical the idea of one God creating the world must have been in a world of many gods. So, where did it come from? If we are to discover the origins of the creation story, we have to track down the origins of the Jewish belief in that one God, without which creation could not have been written. The one thing we can say for sure is that you can't write the story of one God creating the world unaided and unopposed until you've stopped worshipping all other gods. All roads lead to Jerusalem, a city holy to the three great monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity and Islam. According to traditional theology, the first five books of the Bible are the unmediated word of God as dictated to Moses 3,000 years ago or more. Monotheism, allegiance to a single, all-powerful creator, is supposed to go back even further to Abraham, only 20 generations on from Adam. But the findings of archaeologists here in Jerusalem are undermining such assumptions, suggesting that both the creation story and the belief in a single God are of far more recent origin. These are the remains of residential dwellings dating from around 800 BC, located just outside the walls of Jerusalem. Oded Lipschitz is one of Israel's leading archaeologists. Oded thinks that the Jewish belief in a single God of creation did not take hold until many centuries after Moses supposedly wrote the creation story down. We have archaeology and we have the Bible. From the um, arche pure archaeological point of view, you have hundreds, we have now more than 1,000 small kind of amulets, uh, figurines symbolizing a belief in a feminine god. You have two main uh, types of it. One is a very simple type of a figurine, handmade. These are kind of symbols of a feminine goddess. The presence of these fertility symbols in Jewish homes tells Oded that Jews were still worshipping multiple gods hundreds of years after Moses, which suggests the story of one god creating the universe could not yet have been written. 
For Oded, it was only at the end of the 8th century BC that Jews began, slowly, to place their trust in one supreme being. A trust that was severely tested when in 586 BC, the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem. The evidence for this disaster still survives. Just in this area, a huge destruction level was discovered with a very, very big uh, ash layer and with a lot of uh, arrowheads like this one used by the Babylonian army. The temple in Jerusalem was sacked and thousands were hauled off to exile in Babylon. What did this tell the Jews about their all-powerful God and protector? It was a, a, a horrible surprise because it went against all the lessons that they started to learn about if we will believe in one God. We have a insurance that nothing will happen. And suddenly Jerusalem was destroyed. And I think that it put a big question mark on all the Judean identity, belief, and theology. How can you go on believing in a God who abandons you to your fate? It's a question Jews have had reason to ask more than once in their long history. At this stage, according to Oded, the creation story was still to be written. And one wonders how it ever was. The disaster ought to have finished off the Jewish religion. It didn't. Instead, it was from the trauma of exile that the extraordinary story of a single, all-powerful God speaking the world into existence would emerge. According to traditional Jewish and Christian belief, the creation story was dictated by God to Moses more than 3,000 years ago. But historians and archaeologists tell us that belief in a single all-powerful God of creation was still in the making when the Jews were hauled off to exile in Babylon in 586 BC, more than 500 years after Moses was thought to have lived. So, when was the creation story written? Yaira Amit is a biblical scholar. I met her at the shrine of the book in Jerusalem, where the oldest copies of Judaism's most sacred texts, the Torah, are kept. Yaira believes that it's from this period of the Jewish exile in Babylon that the creation story and many other parts of the Old Testament date. What could have happened is that the Jewish god Yahweh vanishes and that they start worshipping Babylonian gods. Babylon, the, and some did? Uh, I, I'm sure. But uh, what is very interesting is that not all of them assimilated. Uh, and if you ask why, the question is because of spiritual or intellectual leaders. And those leaders said to them, we sinned and here we are punished. But the thing that you're describing is, is extraordinary, really. You were saying that we have sinned, therefore everything that's happened is our fault. Yeah. I mean, how, yeah. new, how, new, a yeah. how new a theological concept is that? Uh, this, this concept is, is very new, that uh, we are here because our God, who is the only one God, wants us to be punished, and therefore, the exile is temporary, and if we will, if we are loyal to our God, and if we behave according to His uh, to His laws, uh, we have hope, and we shall come back to our country. And this seed is the beginning of Judaism. Rather than believe their God had abandoned them or simply been defeated the Jews read their exile as proof of his unequal power. They had sinned, and this was his thundering punishment. Even the Babylonians were subject to his command. 
It was in this period that Jewish thinkers began to write down their history in earnest, wishing to show that their God was without peer, had always been with them, and had planned their destiny from the very start of creation. Is that the order of it? We discover the necessity to think historically yeah. about ourselves, yeah. so yeah. we must write yeah. the history of us. We must write the history because the history is the real evidence for what, uh, for what happened to, to us from the historical point of view or for, and, and in order to, to understand our belief. And the creation story is, is written out of this? Of course. At this time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The creation story draws heavily on Babylonian and other Middle Eastern creation myths. They too see creation as the victory of order over chaos, but in these, the world is born out of conflict between the gods. The Jewish god, by contrast, works alone in wonderful isolation, creating the world in an act of benign will. Fifty years after the fall of Jerusalem, Babylon was conquered by the Persians and the Jews were set free. Their faith had been rewarded and they returned to Israel with a monotheism made more fervent by exile. They now had a sophisticated creation story shaped to demonstrate God's good intentions from the very beginning and a new dedication to scholarship and analysis. They returned, in other words, as people of the book. Two and a half thousand years later, this passion for learned disputatiousness, in which no word is allowed to go unexamined or unilluminated, still survives in the yeshivas or seminaries of Jerusalem. So the creation story might not, after all, have been handed down by God to Moses but it reflects an extraordinary development in religious thinking. By reading the humiliating defeat of their nation as proof of the power of their almighty God, the Jews turn a political disaster into a theological triumph. Instead of residing in a temple in a ruined city, God can now go everywhere with the Jews. He is the God of the creating word and the sole loving architect of humanity. For the next two and a half thousand years, he reigns unchallenged in his heavens. 600 years after he cleared out all rivals as God of the Jews, he became the God of the Christians. And 600 years after that, the God of Islam. Despite the best efforts of historians, archaeologists and scientists to dissuade them, millions of Jews, Christians and Muslims still believe with unshakable conviction in the literal truth of the creation story. This, for them, remains the only account of how the world began. In pursuit of such unshakable conviction, I am returning to where I began. Not exactly the Garden of Eden, but Manchester. I grew up here as a non-Orthodox Jew, not so much rejecting the Jewish religion as leaving it to others. Judaism confused and frightened me, and too much of it was in a foreign language. I read the Bible in English, not Hebrew. When God said, let there be light, he said it in a Manchester accent. But I had relatives who were very different. Howard, Howard. Well, how oh, lovely to see you. Lovely you as well. Come in. Come how are in. you? Thank God I'm fine, and you? I'm all right. Thank you. I'm all right. Hey! Hey! Yom ha-shishi, v'yichu lo ha-shamayim v'aretz v'chol tzva'am. 
ויחד אלוקים ביום השביעי, מלאכתו אשר עשה, וישבות ביום השביעי מכל מלאכתו אשר עשה. My cousin Susan married Avraham, a rabbi who belongs to the strictly orthodox Chabad Lubovitch movement. Avrami is their son-in-law and also a rabbi. Pari Hagafen. And what exactly do the words Pari Pari Hagafen mean? They mean we bless you God, King of the Universe, who has... created the fruit of the vine. They are reminding me how Jews commemorate the Sabbath, the day God rests after the creation. you agree with that? You have to light the candles, cover your eyes so that you don't see actually the candles. As Orthodox Jews, they could never allow us to film the real thing because for them the Friday night ritual is deeply holy, nothing less than a reenactment of creation itself. That is what Shabbat is. It's the day when the world is the celebration of, of God's culmination, of the perfection, the completion of the world, and we celebrate the wonderful gift that he has given us, this world. The Talmud says that when we hold a glass of wine on Friday night and say these words, we become partners in the act of creation. Really? Yeah. Do I need to be saying these words at the same time as I'm drinking the wine, or will drinking the wine be enough? You drink after enough? you say the words. <laughs> When you finish, you drink. That's a lovely idea, being a partner. <laughs> it, is, it is a lovely idea, being a partner in it. Right? Yeah, well, well, because we... So what, a partner with God, with in God. a sense? Oh, yeah. Yes. This is not a question you normally bring up at a family occasion, but I have to ask it. God made the earth and all the creatures on it in six days. Is that your understanding of how we got here? That's what we've been taught for thousands of years. from childhood onwards. And you believe that? Implicitly. The bottom line is, belief transcends rationale and understanding. Our understanding takes us to a certain level, but then belief and faith kicks in. You can't rationalize faith. I'm much affected by that. I love the idea of our being partners in creation because it it humanizes the whole story and it reminds us of our creativity and I'm touched too by the fact that every Friday night creation is remembered and re-enacted I think that's extraordinary that there are people who are Jews who are able to feel that they are living continuously with that story and living as though at the again and again week upon week as though at the beginning of time but for it to work they say it you have to have faith and if you don't have the faith in that story in the truth of that story where are you The big question for me is how to believe and not believe at the same time, to do justice to the poetic subtlety of the creation story without exposing it to the ridicule of those for whom scientific evidence is the only measurement of truth. Let's confront the absolutists, those who absolutely believe and those who absolutely don't. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Today there are many for whom this image of a God-made world is not good. A militant new atheism is in the wind and I've come to its holiest shrine, the Natural History Museum in London, a temple to Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. Here, room after room of fossils and skeletons testify, sometimes with great beauty, to the Earth's not being thousands but billions of years old. conclusive evidence that life is not the product of divine will, but of the brutal laws of natural selection.
doubts about creation did not suddenly surface the day Darwin published on the origin of species. Doubt is as old as faith. But Darwin certainly armed religious skeptics with an alternative explanation of how life began. If we got here the way Darwin said we got here, they argue, then God hasn't only left us, he never made us in the first place. And to think otherwise is willful, not to say wicked, irrationality. I am meeting a good friend who has no patience for such irrationality. Professor A.C. Grayling is a distinguished philosopher and one of Britain's most vocal atheists. <laughs> How lovely to see you. All right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We meet beneath the disconcertingly benevolent gaze of Charles Darwin. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I would like to ask you, did he? Except I know what you're going to say, so I'll ask you instead, how do you know he didn't? Well, firstly, there are so many different creation myths from so many different parts of history, so many different cultures, and all of them share something in common, which is the ignorance of the people who created the creation myths. What they wanted was a story to tell. They wanted a narrative. They wanted a, a beginning for things. And so they made up a story about an agent, bigger, stronger than they were, from which the world came. Out of ignorance. Out of ignorance. That's yeah. quite, I mean, that's quite scornful. Think of this. If you thought that the wind and the thunder were agents, like yourself, but invisible and more powerful, and then you discovered over many generations that they weren't, that they were part of nature, the agencies in question would begin to move out of nature up to the mountaintops and then into the sky and finally outside space and time altogether. As the horizons of knowledge advance, so the gods vanish further and further you're away. You're not explaining the necessity for them. If we've answered all those other questions, why did men go, why didn't they just jettison it? Nobody really believes it. What people want is, they want to believe it. And they therefore stop themselves thinking about it too clearly. Well, let me tell you I am the opposite. I don't believe it. I don't believe any of it. I don't believe it as much as you don't believe it. But I want to believe it. <laughs> because it seems to me it's an access. No, it's not true that I want to believe it. I just think there are, I just think there is something there that they believe that is not negligible. This is issued in great thought, in great beauty, and in beautiful literature, and in beautiful music. I simply want to honour the, the imaginative necessity that drives people to believe, okay. and that all your reasoning in the world doesn't answer for. Now, nobody can deny, absolutely no one can deny, that our emotional lives, what in a secular sense I would call our spiritual lives, are the most important thing about us. That is why poetry and music matter. That is why love matters. That's why human relationships matter. Why is it necessary, in addition to the to, to, to the beautiful music, to the stirring poetry, to the profundity of our love for other people, to add on these ancient stories of gods and ghosts. That's not they, the order. They don't do anything to enrich it. And but even indeed, historically, they get in the way of it. There's an old Jewish joke. That God you don't believe in, the rabbi tells the atheist. I don't believe in either. How many religious people, I wonder, recognize the God in whom atheists don't believe? And how many religious people feel driven by the new atheism to assert their faith more obstinately than they would have in the past? No, this isn't the American Bible Belt, it's central London. Here, just a short bus ride from the Natural History Museum, but undeterred by its findings, people flock to hear the teachings of creationism. I cannot myself feel contempt for whatever consolations this congregation finds in its religion. Belief assuages sorrow, but at what cost to reason? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And you'll notice there's no attempt made here or anywhere else in the Bible to prove the existence of God. Actually, the very attempt to do so can be somewhat insulting to him. It's like someone asking you, prove that you had a father and mother. 
Well, you wouldn't be here if you hadn't. And it's an Greg Haslam is senior pastor at the Westminster Chapel and an ardent believer in the literal truth of the Bible, including the creation story. For you, creation is true? Absolutely true. God makes the world and everything alive in it in six days. In six days, yeah. You are, of course, well aware that there are many people out there who would say this is bunkum. I'm very much aware of that. I certainly am familiar with all that our critics say about us. But I believe the science is on our side, not theirs. You have the science on your side? I believe so, yeah. I was taught the same things that they believe and then came to see them with different pair of eyes, as it were, different pair of glasses. So the fossil record and sedimentary layers of the Earth, fossils aren't formed gradually over time because dead animals rot or they're eaten by predators. How could a whole dinosaur be preserved without sudden catastrophic burial? Noah's flood. So that's a different lens to look at the same facts and interpret them differently. But why do you even want the science on your side? Why don't you say to the scientists, you do your thing, I do my thing? Because biblical faith, as opposed to other religious perspectives in this world, is rooted in events that happened in history. And if the facts could be proved to be untrue, the faith is without foundation. But you're becoming, you're, f you're fighting the scientist with his own tools. Let them have mere fact. What do you want fact uh, it's for? It's not mere fact. You've got, this, you've got this wonderful poetry, you've got these wonderful stories which, t which talk to us in so many ways. Fact. So my faith is not anchored in a mythical upper story realm that has nothing to do with the real world. It's anchored in the total reality God has made and it ought to accord with that total reality. That's why science is important. It is not Reverend Haslam's faith I find problematic, but the distortion of science to support it. The religious are easy pickings for atheists when they fly in the face of reason. A longing for absolute truth hides in the human heart. Absolute atheism, absolute creationism, dance to the same tune, each driving the other to further and further extremes of absolute conviction. For me, neither position leaves room for what the poet John Keats called negative capability. Mystery, uncertainty, doubt. And since these are what make for creativity, they are precisely what we must bring to the creation story. Let us see then where mystery and uncertainty are to be found. attempt to steer a path between the competing extremes of unswerving belief and unswerving disbelief has brought me to Cambridge, where I read English literature in the 1960s. Among the writers I most enjoyed was Coleridge, who dismissed attempts to subject the Bible to scientific inquiry by saying that the Bible found him, and that was evidence enough. It's the final word on all writing. It finds you or it doesn't. You are never far from literature when you put your mind to religion, and you are never far from religion when you put your mind to literature. I studied English literature here in Cambridge, imagining I was leaving Jewishness behind. But in fact, I was doing what the boys I observed at the Jerusalem Yeshiva were doing, interpreting, interrogating, discriminating. You could say that creation itself was the first great act of discrimination. God calling for light and then distinguishing this from that. See here, land there, this day holy, that day not. The emergence of clarity from lightless chaos in the creation story is to me a thing of immense intellectual beauty, a beauty which scientists too can appreciate. I'm off to meet one who does appreciate that beauty. The Reverend Sir John Polkinghorne is a particle physicist and one of Britain's most celebrated scientists. 
He's also an ordained Anglican priest, a combination that bewilders people who are rigid in their distinctions. I notice that you have the distinction, the dubious distinction of being mentioned by Dawkins in his God Delusion book as one of the, I think, the good scientists who believe, or one of the good religious yes, scientists. Yes, he's sort of a bit incredulous about how, how he could be so stupid. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. What's, what's, what's he so puzzled about? He's puzzled because he has such a distorted and caricature view of religion. I mean, he thinks, for example, uh, that um, a typical creationist who believes the world is 6,000 years old and so on, came into being in the course of a hectic week, is the typical religious believer. And of course, it's very easy to scorn and demolish a straw men of that kind. So what is it in relation to the creation story, which is oh. our subject, that you believe? When you read something like the early chapters of the Bible, you have to figure out what it is you're reading. If you think it is a scientific account of a hectic six days of divine activity, then of course you'll think it's all nonsense. But it isn't that. And you're abusing the text if you try and read it in that way. It is something deeper and more interesting than that. It's theological text. The message of Genesis 1 is not God did this and then did that, but nothing exists except through the will of God. God said, let there be. For Dr. Polkinghorne, his scientific knowledge, far from undermining his faith, actually bolsters it. He's fascinated by how precisely the physics and the chemistry of the universe must be structured in order to make it possible for life on Earth to evolve. Science explores the world, and it finds that the world is deeply and wonderfully ordered. And that suggests to me that there is a divine mind behind the order of the world. For example, we have discovered that we live in a universe that is very special, very particular. We find that a world that is capable of producing carbon-based life has to be a very particular world indeed in its given physical fabric. That's to say the laws of nature which operated following the Big Bang have to take a very specific form. If they'd been a little bit different, there would be no carbon and there would be no carbon-based life. That's very surprising. And again, you have to ask the question, is that just our luck? Or is it because we don't, in fact, live in a world that's any old world, but a world that is a creation, which has been designed by its creator in the sense of being given the intrinsic potentiality that will enable it to have a, the fruitful history that brings forth carbon-based life. And of course, it's the, the last uh, understanding that I find the most coherent and intellectually satisfying. This much I am now settled in my mind about you don't have to deny the findings of science to call yourself a religious man. You can be for Darwin and for the creator. It's a nonsense to say the creation story fails as science. The two are on entirely different errands. So, what is the errand of the creation story? And why does it resonate so powerfully with an unreligious man like me. Mary Midgley is a moral philosopher. She's 90 years old and throughout her distinguished career has put her mind to what religion means for human beings. She believes we cannot understand what the creation story is for unless we grasp the power of myth. I do think we have to shake ourselves and think again about how we view myths in general, because this is primarily a myth. That is to say, it's an imaginative vision which serves as a background to all the rest of life. And that is uh, not something that uh, anybody can live without. I tell you, when I hear you speaking like this, you might be surprised to hear me say this, but you remind me of D.H. Lawrence. Lawrence says, the human heart must have an absolute. And when the human heart doesn't have an absolute, the center falls apart, he says. And I have read you, and you talk about the center bleeding when there's nothing beyond ourselves. I mean, I think the point is uh, that we are far too limited, isn't it? I mean, the natural way to think of ourselves is as part of a greater whole. To try to do without that, um, I think, is totally unnatural to Homo sapiens. What do you think about the new atheists and how they're reading these stories? 
you know, they've made an extraordinary jump to the idea that only literal meaning should ever be taken seriously. Um, if you've just been to a performance of King Lear, your question afterwards is not, well, was there a King Lear at that particular time? Did his daughters really? You know, uh, it isn't that kind of question. The sort of importance that people feel science has these days is due to a great quest for certainty. So it's no different from religion? Oh, no, not in that respect, yes. Except it doesn't, it's not so nutritious. It's not so nutritious? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we have forgotten how to read the Bible, not because we are too sophisticated, but because we are not sophisticated enough. Mary Midgley reminds us of the lessons to be drawn from art, whether it's King Lear or a soap opera. We know they are made up, but still we are enthralled. The made up issues from our imaginations and our imaginations outstrip mere fact and reason. The concept that something can be both true and untrue is one that religious people seem better able to grasp than atheists. It seems to me that what Genesis is, is a kind of Jewish equivalent of what in Greece was philosophy. Only the Greeks saw truth as system and the Jews saw truth as story. So the opening of the Bible is, here are the first principles, this is what life is about. Does this get us out then of having to argue with scientists about what could scientifically have happened at such and such a date? Um, I think so, because uh, clearly the Bible isn't science. It's about, you know, telling the human story and adding that one crucial dimension that we are not alone. The idea of God in search of man is the real drama, the driving drama of the Bible. Religion is not an explanation of how the universe came into being, it's not a means of saving our eternally guilty soul. Religion is the redemption of solitude. It's just possible that in the course of making this film, I have become a little more religious, or at least a little less non-religious than I was. I've grown in my attachment anyway to the God of creation, who has yet to become the glowering Yahweh so detested by atheists. He is fresh to himself, as we in creation are fresh to ourselves. Everything is to play for. That's what moves me most, the idea that we are delivered, still warm from the kiln, as it were, into our own hands, and yet not cast adrift. A myth does not shrivel at the first dry touch of science. Those who wrote this myth two and a half thousand years ago did not know what we know, but creation still describes existence in a magnificent simplicity of language that binds us to them. It remains a story, it does our hearts good to know, that we are made in the image of a creator who reveled in creativity for its own sake. He made us out of no other motive than an artist's joy in making and saw that we were good. This, I now understand, is the enchantment of the creation story. Forget the supernatural. Creation roots us in the wonder of our own drama. The children of a marvelous, utterly mysterious act of giving, gifted with the marvelous ourselves. What a beginning. In the next program, journalist Raggy Omar goes in search of the prophet Abraham. We're descendants of Abraham, who is the man who signed on the dotted line with God. But Abraham's children seem to be at war. Is Abraham's legacy one of the greatest sources of division in the world today? Or does the great patriarch hold the key to peace and reconciliation? <laughs>